everybody. We're so glad everybody's here. Thank you for coming. We're so excited today. I cannot wait for you to hear these three speakers. They're all three super amazing. And one of the things that um, we wanted to make sure um, that we did was show you our own gardens because that was some of the feedback we got last time. So um, all three of the speakers this time are doing that. So first up speaking is Kathy McFan, and she's going to be um, talking about your transition from your spring summer garden into your fall winter garden and transitioning in a more no-till way. We talked about no-till last time, so we're going to continue introducing that concept. Um, and you'll get a good look at her garden, which is amazing. Then we're going to Kitty Ritz, and we heard her last time. She's got a great presentation this time on starting balls, fall veggies from seeds. Um, and you'll get a great look at her garden, and she's got a nice video in there for us as well. And then Ellie Samuel, who you heard last time as well, she is going to be talking about brassicas, which are um, cauliflower, broccoli, those types of crops, because those are the ones that um, are cool weather crops for the most part. All right, so I'm going to be talking to you about this transition time of uh, late summer into fall because we live in an area where you can have essentially a garden year round here in Sonoma County, God's country, uh, according to Luther Burbank. So it is now the time of fruiting and um, your garden is probably pretty full of various kinds of fruits, um, peppers, tomatoes, uh, squash, you might be getting a little tired of squash, it's a little hard to give it away now. Um, you've plant, if you've planted winter squashes, they're beginning to head towards even being ripe. Uh, my delicatas are early and they're uh, ripe. Um, but in the fall, in October, you, can, you will be harvesting, continuing to harvest a lot of your garden. But if you want a full garden, you need to think about it now and you need to be planting things now for fall and winter. So I'm gonna be talking about a way of gardening, which is a no-till intensive year-round gardening approach. This is an introduction to this concept. And um, if you watched Martha Stewart recently, apparently she talked about rototilling. Um, here in Sonoma County in the Master Gardeners, um, we don't talk about rototilling except in unusual situations. Um, and we're talking about an approach that is sustainable, that's good for the earth uh, and good for you and good for the soil. So this is just a picture of one of my um, garden beds. I have, I'm in Sebastopol. I have a fairly large garden for one person to maintain. And um, this is a few weeks ago. It was the last plantings of beans are uh, coming towards fruit, the basil, there was cilantro. And over on the right, you can see some spigarello, which is one of the brassicas that we'll be talking about, and some kale. Some of these uh, can, can, the kale, the spigarello, almost can be a year-round planting. So this is a way of planting which uh, provides you an ongoing crop of various kinds of vegetables. So if you want in late October to be having a garden that's really abundant, you need to be planting um, both seeds and transplants now through September and maybe a few things in October. Okay. In order to really uh, provide an intensely planted uh, area, you need to continue to enrich the soil. But as master gardeners who focus on a sustainable gardening approach that is good for the earth as well as good for us, we really encourage creating a live soil. Use um, compost enriched beds, mulch, and later in the year we'll be talking about cover crops as a way to enrich your soil. So you need to be adding things back if you're going to be drawing a lot of things from your garden. 
So this is a uh, compost. And um, I did think when we started Master Gardeners that everybody did their own compost and just use that, but no. There are places you can get compost throughout the county. I'm not gonna go into those right now, but they're accessible. And uh, compost is a whole, whole nother topic. You can find books on it if you are really a gardening geek. So this is a, a cover crop in October. It's a Phacelia tenacifolia. It's a lovely flower um, in the spring. And it also is something that can be uh, cut down as a cover crop to enrich the beds. We'll be talking about cover crops probably in uh, September or October. So in order to have an, uh, um, a garden that's intensely planted, you need to get a little bit creative and you can in, uh, interplant plants of different kinds, different days to maturity and different root zones. So this is a, a garden bed in October, um, late October. And as you can see, it uh, is intensively planted. It's got some of the larger broccolis, some of the larger greens, and then it has some of the lettuces. And in fact, um, uh, where the lettuces are, there will probably be um, other things planted, which are a larger plant. And as the lettuces uh, are cut out, um, the larger plants will continue to produce. So um, in order for me to do an intensive garden, I use as many transplants as possible so that I can keep the ground covered and, uh, and the, um, keep roots in the soil as much as possible. In contrast to the way we used to think about gardening, which was you wanted to pull those plants out, get rid of them, um, we really, as we've been able to see things at a microscopic level, we're able to see that there is a tremendous amount of uh, life around the root zone. And that keeping roots in the soil keeps the uh, balance of the beneficial mycorrhizal, fungal, and a microbial life in the soil. So you want to continue to leave those roots there at all times. So you're going to be using transplants. Um, here are a bunch of transplants that I started in a um, ogro, not to advertise them, but it's a, it's a little grow house. And they're available online, though they were sold out when the pandemic started, because as many gardening things were. Um, a no-till approach uh, uses um, leaves the roots in the soil, cuts the spent plantings at the base of the plant, and tries to disturb the soil and the life of the soil as little as possible. For a lot of people, this is a different approach. Um, and it's sometimes hard to do when you look at leaving a root in the soil, but it actually benefits your next plantings. So this is a picture of my garden about a week ago. Um, and you can see um, the cucumbers are growing up a trellis. There were some beans on a trellis behind that. The cucumbers are on kind of a, um, a, a trellis that's that's leaning and the cucumbers can go down through the baskets help cover some of the plants that are started and in front of that um, in front of the cucumbers I have a, a plant called a spigarello which is a broccoli uh, variation like a uh, broccoli ancestor and you eat the leaves and I'm going to be doing a second planting of spigarello in front of that so that I get a, a continuous supply of, of the plant. So planting things in sequence uh, one after another so that you don't do just a single large planting but you, maybe you do some smaller plantings allows you to keep a continuous supply of uh, fresh plants coming. So these are the uh, spigarello growing in the grow house and uh, this grow house uh, at this point, it's really, really hot if it's out in the sun. So you want to keep it covered with some kind of shade material if you're going to be um, starting plants at this point in the year. So here's the spigarello. And you're going to want to um, make sure it's well watered before you transplant it. You're going to be gently separating the roots, digging a very small planting hole, 
And I do, uh, if I'm planting intensively, I often do add a small and very small amount of general fertilizer at the transplant hole below the root zone and or um, add compost directly around the plant. Partly depends how heavy a feeder was in the, the ground before that. And we will, as we go on, we'll be talking about um, different kinds of plants that can rotate and follow others. So you gently um, separate those roots and you want to be looking for plants. If you're buying plants which are available now in the nurseries of various kinds of uh, brassicas and greens, if you're going to, somebody's got their sound on. Um, if you, if you're going to be buying those, you want to make sure that the roots still are loose. They're not tightly wrapped because if a plant gets tightly wrapped with its roots, um, it becomes root bound and it's harder for it to start. So these have a nice set of roots. I separate them out. I dig the small hole and I put the uh, spigarello, young spigarello next to its larger cousins. You can see they're planted right along the drip line. Uh, you can see both it has compost and some mulch on top of that. So there are different kinds of plants that you can plant right now. If you think about it, a lot of the plants we're eating currently and harvesting are the fruits, the fruits of our labor, the summertime things. There are uh, root vegetables uh, can be planted now, but most of them, as Kitty will talk about, can be planted from and are better planted from, from seeds. Um, beets and turnips are uh, some that I've actually been able to uh, start well from transplants and it gives you a little bit of a head start, but they also do well from seeds. Um, and, you know, I've tried potatoes, putting them in now you know, under compost and then uh, piling in the compost up throughout the winter and you can keep those potatoes going for a while, just saying. Um, yeah, so all of those roots are things that can be growing in the garden through fall and into winter. This is uh, just a quick uh, shot of some uh, radishes with carrots started next to them. Um, and Kitty's gonna be talking about planting the, them. You can see these covers uh, keep the birds from eating all my carrots. And there they go, they finally sprouted. So these are the beets. These are the one root vegetable that I usually uh, plant from a transplant. The brassicas, which uh, Ellie's going to be talking about, and particularly in relation to pests, these are a wide-ranging um, plant group. And they have, uh, we eat both the leaves and the flowers, if you think about uh, broccolis and cauliflowers. And we also sometimes do eat the roots um, this is a, these are kale and various broccolis. And as I get said, um, I started them in July and I'm pu definitely putting them out now. Uh, you might start them from seed now, but you want to do it like yesterday. Um, but they certainly are available in nurseries and they're great vegetables through the winter. So collards, um, this is uh, one of the, the roots that we eat, or actually it's the stem, I guess. Of the, this is the kohlrabi, uh, which I grew just as an experiment one year. They're gorgeous, um, not my favorite vegetable. So choose plants that you like if you're going to grow them. Um, and I love broccoli and I love cauliflower, and so they're well worth growing. This is kale, which really is a, a practically a year-round product in most of our gardens. And those you can be putting out now and you can also be starting from seed. These are uh, Caraflex cabbages where it started from seed. I love them, they take a lot of space. Um, there are alliums that you can start uh, right now. Um, I've not had great success uh, with my fall plantings of onions, they tend to bolt. Um, for me, um, but green onions and leeks should be planted and they are very productive and easy to grow. Uh, we'll talk about garlic when we head into October, a great and fairly easy crop to grow. 
So these are some onion starts. I do start the onions both uh, in seed packs and also start them in the ground. Greens, all of those kinds of greens, actually some of those are probably uh, considered brassica greens, the masuna and the komatsuna, the Asian greens, but all the Asian greens, the lettuces, our chards, um, I put in parsley and cilantro. It's great to get a, a final crop of those in the ground. And all of those can be started from seeds and six packs. Uh, I use a combination usually of a potting soil, a good organic potting soil, mixed with something to, to lighten the soil like vermiculite and some good compost mixed in and have pretty good success with that. So these are some greens started in the grow house. Uh, there's arugula and you can see if you look down there on the right corner, there's a little leaf miner that found its way in. I didn't see that. But uh, arugula is something I keep again largely throughout the year as a continuous crop uh, and the same is true for chard which you see in the upper left corner. Basil is something I can, I've uh, put in my last planting of basil because I consider it one of the essential essential uh, um, herbs in, in my garden. Uh, the lettuce is, be starting lettuce now from seed and in, and in, your, uh, in your grow house or you can start it inside in a six pack. Uh, pretty easy to start, pretty easy to uh, grow in the garden. You want to provide at this point in the year, the trick is as we transition season, the trick is to find a way to make sure that things stay cool enough. Um, so you're gonna to need to either put those lettuces uh, sort of behind the cucumbers where they might be shaded in the shade of a larger tomato plant or provide some kind of uh, shade yourself for the garden. So tatsoi, uh, another kind of green that is, uh, there you see it planted again along the drip line. I have it, uh, the tatsoi is planted where the uh, asparagus fronds, which are now growing uh, tall and um, and green and leafy, where they they shade the tot soy. So get creative about looking for the spots, little microclimates in your garden, where you can plant the cooler season vegetables. So we want to have a lot of greens in the fall garden, um, and these are just pictures of greens in the fall garden. And uh, just as a note, you can pop in some peas in your garden if you wanna get them growing. You do have to watch the birds, which as we head into later fall and into um, uh, late summer and, and early fall, the birds start looking for tender greens and the, the peas are one of their favorites. So you might have to cover them to get them to, to grow. So, there's the, the broccolis that's gonna be ready in um, early November, mid-November. Um, you wanna have things really grown to a pretty good size by um, early November because hit mid-November we head towards the, what's called the Persephone period. Uh, and if you know that story, if you don't, check it, check it in your uh, mythology. But it really speaks to the time when the earth kind of goes to sleep. It's when we don't have enough uh, daylight hours for plants to really continue to grow effectively. So we want things to some level of maturity so that we can have some produce in the fall and then very, very early spring. Okay, I think uh, here are some basic principles. These slides will be available. We talked about the no-till approach. There's a lot of that available on the Sonoma County Master Gardener website. And then it is something that's promoted uh, much more widely in regenerative agriculture and um, by the United Nations. So, uh, you know, no-till approach to gardening is becoming something that's much more commonly accepted and known. And there's a lot of material out there and available. Okay. Great, thank you, Kathy, that was wonderful. And um, we're heading up now to uh, Kitty Ritz. And Kitty is going to be telling us about starting fall veggies from seeds. And please feel free to add things in the chat and we will answer the questions at the end. Um, or if we have a link, we'll get those to you right away. So take it away, Kitty. 
All right. From the sublime, as in Kathy's garden, to the ridiculous. My name is Kitty Ritz. I live in Santa Rosa in a neighborhood. I only have a yard. I don't have property. My gardening area is limited because I also want to provide for pollinators, birds, etc. So um, this is going to be about seeds that you can plant right now in August. So these are some seeds that you can plant. I find that if you're going to plant seeds, you might as well find varieties that are interesting that you may not necessarily um, find everywhere. Of course, we live in Sonoma County where there's lots of interesting seeds. This is an important chart that's available on the Master Gardener um, Food Gardening website. And that resource is available for you in the chat. It's important because it tells you what you can grow. And if you go to the third column, D slash T, that tells you whether it's a direct seed or a transplant. The next column tells you about the planting window. So some of these are very large. The next tells you the last planting date. So August 15th is just around the corner, but some things you have until October 15th, November 15th, before you can stop seeding them. As you continue across, DTM stands for dates to maturity. So later in the year, you're looking for things that have a shorter date to maturity because you have to beat that clock um, for when the season truly changes and we enter the Persephone period. And starting seeds indoors and starting seeds putting them out as transplants. So direct sow is what I'm gonna talk about. I'm looking at carrots and beets and radishes. So this is the germination test that you need to do. Seeds in a packet always exceed the number of seeds that you might use in a single planting. So when you have leftover seeds on the seed packet, you will have marked um, the year that you purchased them. You don't know that the seeds are still viable until you do this very scientific test. You get yourself a piece of wet paper towel, lay out 10 seeds, roll it up, label it and stick it in a jar. You may have to add additional water to the bottom of the jar and unroll it every day or two after a couple days to see whether or not you're sprouting. So when you have 75% germination, your seeds are really good. You can count however many out of 10. Here they are marked with little popsicle sticks in their jar and I put them on top of my refrigerator. So I'm going to plant carrots and radishes together because carrot seeds are minute, easy to lose and radishes and take a very long time to germinate. Radishes pop up rapidly, easily and they break the way for the carrots and also um, give you something to hold with the carrot seed so that it doesn't um, get lost or clump up very densely. So you make a seed mixture. You can use cornmeal, you can use sand, and you mix together the cornmeal to show where the other seeds are. It doesn't add anything to the process other than that. And you can put your cornmeal directly into your furrow 
or you can put the cornmeal in a little box with the seeds, as you see here. This is my garden outside. And as you can see, I've taken things out of this box. This is where my onions and garlic were. There's quarter inch drip tubing. And every six inches on my drip tubing, there's a fat spot that has a drip emitter. I know that this composted area, this area has been amended with compost recently because I did that. I've taken off the um, straw that was my mulch and I'm taking beet seeds and I'm going along and I'm putting a beet seed on each side of the emitter and pushing it in about a half an inch deep. How do I know how deep to do it? It's on the seed packet. Beets um, are pretty easy to germinate. If you're worried about your beets or have had bad luck in the past, you might want to soak them overnight. This is worm compost, worm castings, and this is a fine sieve so that the other things that are in with the castings are um, ground up because when you are starting seeds from uh, crops from seed directly, they need a finer soil surface to um, sprout successfully. So I get my compost all over and I gently cover up the beets and press them into the soil, as Kathy mentioned. The next furrow, you can see that my best gardening tool is my hand. My next furrow doesn't need to be as deep, and this is where the carrots and radishes will go. You'll also notice that there are other crops still in here. There's a sunflower, there's shade going on, because last week when I took this video, it was extremely hot. You wouldn't know by today. I'm sprinkling the seeds into the furrow, trying to distribute those tiny carrot seeds along with the radishes so that they are evenly distributed. And when they come up later, one of the ways to thin your carrots is with a pair of nail scissors rather than pulling them out. If you pull out those little tiny carrots, um, I have read that that's an invitation to carrot rust fly. I've never had carrot rust fly, but it's something to know. Also, that leaves the root in the ground, just like the no-till that Kathy mentioned. More worm compost all over, sling in the seeds. You have to remember that a seed is um, a baby with its own lunchbox. Everything the seed needs is incorporated except for the water and the soil. This is carrot seed. It's going to take two weeks to germinate. So I cover it with burlap. This is uh, a product that you can get in um, a good uh, nursery supply or you can go to a coffee producer and it just holds the moisture in while the seed germinates because I only get out to my garden sometimes to this particular bed once a day. I'm soaking the burlap because it takes longer for the burlap to dry out than it does for the surface of the soil at the half inch deep mark where my seeds are. So I'm not gonna talk much about starting the actual seeds in flats. Uh, that's something that would be a complete uh, episode in itself, but I will say that Kathy talked about potting soil and seed starting mix, and this is my version. I start with aged compost. I always get organic compost, and I add core to it, which is a sustainable coconut fiber. Back in the day, um, every seed starting mix included peat moss. Peat moss is not sustainable. We do not recommend that you use peat moss. Core is a sustainable product and you can find it at a good nursery. 
vermiculite is a product that will lighten up the soil and it is on the um, organic list. And then I always add in worm castings as a fertilizer as well as a compost. It's a double duty um, kind of uh, addition. This is my personal experiment for this year. I have a small garden. I know many people in Santa Rosa and other places in the county have small gardens. So I'm gonna try growing carrots in a pot. I chose a pot that was at least 15 inches in diameter and 12 inches deep. I filled it with that potting mix and I planted my uh, carrot and radish mix in there and also covered it with burlap watered it exactly the same way. You can see that it's in dappled shade until sprouting occurs. And there are the radishes. They're coming up. And if you look really closely, you might see one carrot, very small. And as we say, the carrots are the slower to germinate. So I'm hoping that will work. We have so many different microclimates in um, the Sonoma County that I am in the country and I've got a lot of wind and a lot of open areas and I do almost everything from starts rather than seeds. Um, I loved Kitty's idea with putting the burlap on top of the carrots because carrots take absolutely forever and so if you want to go through and you know get those started they need to be super wet but everything else even the beets I've gone through and I'm, I'm trying some radishes even, some watermelon radishes from starts and I'm putting some in as seeds. But I'm, I grow mine nice and big and what I've done so far is I just took a sheet of um, bird netting, which I absolutely hate, but I put it up on a table and I put my starts underneath there and I covered it over. And I've got a shade cloth over the top. So they're getting some sun, so they're not, you know, growing too long. Um, and they are, they're getting pretty big now, but I'm gonna wait to put those in for a bit until um, I can, things possibly cool down a little bit, but the, for sure those plants get a little bit bigger. I'm trying to protect them from um, the cabbage moth so that they don't eat those all up before I get them in. Uh, Ellie is gonna go ahead and tell you about um, uh, uh, covering your crops, but you know, the bird netting works as far as keeping those, um, any moths or butterflies that are going to lay eggs on your, your brassicas, the broccoli and the cauliflower. I take those zucchinis and um, you know, for me with the cucumber beetle that I talked about last month, um, they love those zucchinis. So I plant them on the ends of those rows or in the ends of the beds, and they do get eaten by the cucumber beetles more. So some of them are about ready, you know, they're about done. I, um, but I leave mine in until I'm getting a lot of yellow leaves on them and not very many new flowers. So I would double check looking at your flowers and seeing at some point you, at least mine, I've noticed that I really don't get enough of the male and the female flowers together at the same time. And you do absolutely need both of those. So, and just to let you know something else, I know a lot of you have planted uh, winter squash. And so the winter squash is, um, if you're counting on that to stay in your, um, garage or wherever your cold storage area um, until you know the, the middle of the winter you need to leave those on the vine until right at that stem end it gets nice and dry there so it's not pulling anything else from the plant if you cut them and eat them now you can eat them now but they're not going to last so same thing with your pumpkins if you've got pumpkins that are starting and you look oh hooray they're already all orange if you don't wait until the, the, you know, the ends, the, the stem dies off, it's not done. So they're not going to last until Halloween for you. 
So I would, I would wait, um, uh, you know, to pick those until right at the end. And I'm, I'm seeing pictures on Facebook with lots of people with pumpkins that are already getting ready. So I'll tell you with the tomatoes, and I know everybody has tomatoes. You want to keep those in the ground forever, it seems like. But, you know, once they start produ stop producing, you know, the, the flowers come on. If you're getting a lot of flowers still, the, unless it's a, um, a cherry tomato, the chances of those flowers developing into tomatoes at this point, probably not super great, but you know, um, you, you can always leave it in as long as you want to. I do take the roots out of the tomato plants um, and put those in the green bin, even if they look healthy. I know lots of people go ahead and, and leave them in as well. The little white butterflies or moths that are fluttering around your garden. Those are cabbage moths, and they will lay their eggs on all your brassicas. They love them, mustard, broccoli, and they won't be too disturbing right now except for the eggs, but later when they come out as little caterpillars, they will be really making a mess of your plants. They're pretty hard to manage um, unless you cover your plants. Um, and you might have noted in um, in my presentation, you saw a lot of little wire trash cans uh, all over uh, the garden. Those are trash cans <laughs> from the dollar store, not to promote the dollar store, but they're very handy. They will keep the cabbage moths off your plants, especially the tender starts. Um, you also uh, saw things that are uh, called uh, food covers, food protectors, those little nets. And those uh, you can get uh, through the internet and those are great. You can cover plants. And then in some of the um, shots that you might have noted, there were the plastic hoops over uh, some of the beds and you can cover those with various kinds of cloth to keep the moths off your plants. Another dreaded plant or um, uh, pest is the squash bug. I don't know if any of you have had squash bugs. They are my nemesis. <laughs> when we started gardening in Sevastopol for 15, 20 years, we had no squash bugs, but then they arrived and they can decimate your plant. You have beautiful squashes, look summer or winter squashes that look like you're going to have a beautiful crop. And then you start to see the plants look kind of yellowing and the leaves are unpleasant looking. And if you notice, there's some very large bugs. Those, again, are fairly, uh, and the UC ANR website is great as a site to give you some suggestions. For the most part, we recommend cultural controls, uh, which are really making sure that when you remove the plant material, if they've had squash bugs, you get rid of them entirely, if possible. And Little hand vacs are great. If you want to go out in the morning and vacuum up some bugs, uh, if you have nothing else to do, and maybe right now, uh, most of us don't have that much else to do. So you can go out and uh, vacuum up your squash bugs. Sometimes when you see them and they're the little nymphs, uh, they're the smaller, smaller uh, life cycle of the squash bug. Uh, you can use a safer soap or sometimes neem oil if you can catch a bunch of them. The other thing you can do with squash bugs is put your squash on a trellis and that helps keep them off the ground and protect them some. Right. What if, uh, can I stick an oar in? Uh, I just recently learned that you can stake zucchini that uh, and that lifts it up off the ground and helps with squash bugs because it always fruits off the highest part of the stem. Mm -hmm. So you can take it, the once you've got it staked up and it continues to grow, you need a pretty big stake, then you could take those lower leaves off and it's not quite as attractive. I noticed that behind Toby, there's good bug, bad bug, great book to have because. The really big Master Gardener IPM message is don't treat anything like a problem until you're sure it's really a problem. 
So if you're doing sustainable gardening, you really need to be tolerant of a certain level of living with other living things. And there's uh, lots of interaction between good bugs and bad bugs. And uh, always check out what the problem is before you act. Uh, the, it's always the last resort to spray something with the exception of water. <laughs> so my favorite pest of August is <laughs> the uh, spider mites. So you see these little dusty specks and webbing all over your garden. I thank you all for your patience. My whole computer system froze. What I was saying is we are so lucky because through the University of California, we have the Integrated Pest Management Program. You'll hear it referred to as IPM. Here is the website. This is an amazing gift to us. You go to this left hand box and you click on home garden, not agricultural, but home garden. And it takes you to home garden, turf and landscape pests. Right here is where you will find vegetables and melons. You can click on that and they will, and you can find answers to common pest problems. There's also the quick links. You have your pest note library. You have pests in the urban garden, plant problem diagnoses. You can go to any one of those and you can check out what is happening in your garden. Now, I heard Kitty talk about the spider mites. This is a great place to put in spider mites and they give you sustainable ways of taking care of pests in your garden. Now, everybody's mentioned that brassicas, and I picked them because the brassica family is very large. It's the mustard family. You can hear, you'll hear it referred to as cold crops or cruciferous vegetables. These are the perfect crops to plant now for fall gardening. And that's why I focused on them. The best thing you can do for your garden is observe. Go out look at the leaves, look at the plant. If you see little holes, you know something's been eating your garden. If you look under the leaf, you will often see what is the problem. Also, do not plant brassicas near tomatoes, beans, peppers, strawberries, and eggplant. They will stunt their growth. Broccoli and cauliflower don't do well planted near each other. Broccoli often gets club root, which is when the root swells and it can't take up water and your plant will die. So here we go. Aphids. Aphids are a very common predator. Oftentimes all you need is a huge swish of water to get them off your plant, the gray aphids are what love brassicas. But things like kale, the aphids suck into the plant and they don't wash off easily. And that's when we are lucky enough to have beneficial insects that help us turn these live aphids into aphid mummies. This is where the aphids used to be before the lace wings, the ladybugs, and the wasps, the tachinid wasp comes and they suck out and kill the juice and kill the aphids by using their juices 
for food. Also, the ladybugs have their little nymphs. The nymphs look like little caterpillars with lion heads, and they are voracious eaters of aphids. Try not to spray because when you spray insecticide, you are killing your beneficial insects along with the bad bugs. Then you have your cabbage white butterfly. The cabbage white butterfly looks cute and pretty, but it also lays lots of eggs on your cabbage and the rest of the brassicas. You turn the leaves over when you observe and you say, oh, eggs, if you can't wash them off, you cut them out. You're not gonna hurt your plant and you will probably save it from the caterpillars that emerge from the eggs and devour the brassica crops. Then there's the cabbage looper. They call it the looper because as you see, it makes a little hump when it goes, when it walks. Their eggs are also yellow, easily spotted underneath the leaf of the brassica. This is the cabbage looper moth. You want to get rid of the eggs before you get the caterpillars because caterpillars will eat and eat and reproduce and you don't want them around in your garden. Then you have cutworms. Cutworms are exactly what they sound like. They lay in the soil, they eat, and they cut the plant off and goodbye plant. They come in different colors. This is the moth that lays, them, that lays the eggs. Now, one of the things you can do for cutworms is to go out early in the morning and gently move the soil away from the stem of your plant and you pick up the cutworms and the caterpillars and drop them in a bucket of soapy water. There are flea beetles. Again, the eggs are very noticeable. If you can't wash them off, cut them off. This is the caterpillar. This is the, these are the beetles. Now, flea beetles are they are dangerous mostly to the younger plants. Older plants can sustain flea beetle damage. The younger plants are destroyed by the flea beetles. And so when you're, you have your starts and your beginning plants, you don't want these near your crops. And that's when, as you saw in Kathy's garden, you have row covers. Row covers protect the plants from the moths who lay the eggs on the plants and destroy them. Row covers can be netting, I mean shade cloth. They can be netting. They can even be an old sheet that you have in your house. The idea is to protect them. These are the metal hoops that you stick in the ground. If you don't have metal hoops, you can use PVC pipe and you can use a little frame made out of wood that you grow. Now, my garden is very small. And just like Kitty, I live in a yard, not a place where I can plant lots of things. So I use a cloche in my garden. A cloche is like a little umbrella that opens, that opens, and you put it over your plants. And, whoops, sorry, and it protects them 
from the damage. It can be wire. It can be a frame. It can be netting. It can be a berry basket that will protect your seedlings. What I was going to show you next, what you can do to prevent cutworms. It's a paper towel roll, and I left the rim out to show you that this is just a little plastic cup that was pushed down underneath once I was finished taking the picture. Underneath these little guys are my cauliflower starts. I started them from seed. One of the things, and I ha don't have it with me, but you all have it at home, toilet paper rolls, paper towel rolls. You cut them, you push them down into the soil, half an inch down to an inch down around your baby plant. The plant sticks up out from the paper towel roll or the toilet paper roll, and it will prevent the cutworms from getting next to your plant to eat the stems. The next thing is you can you be creative. Paper cups, uh, plastic. My grandson loves to eat fruit cups. I cut the middle out of the fruit cup and I stick it down into the soil to prevent the cutworms from getting next to the, the, the plants. Um, so to sum up, be creative, cover plants with anything you have, but remember to uncover them during the day when the sun is beating down, unless you're using uh, something made specifically for that, such as these things. Otherwise, they'll cook underneath. Um, and use things that you have in your house to protect your plants. Thank you, Ellie. And I just want to say those little um, covers that she had over them. Um, I did buy several at the dollar store this year. Um, sadly, those are, uh, they, they didn't hardly even last a day before I had to re-glue all the corners. So Online. Um, yes. You can get them online. And I found that someplace like Bed Bath & Beyond, you can go ahead and get those and um, they're, they're much better. Um, and at the end of the season, <laughs> then they do have them um, on sale as well. So um, if you just sort of watch, of course, now that I said that, everybody's probably going to go through and uh, take a look at that. So uh, you but, can also way back in the day when picnics, uh, people went on picnics, they would <laughs> use um, covers like those to cover their food so the ants and the bugs and the flies wouldn't get on the food. Those are great for your garden too. Okay, that's great. Well, we have a few questions. So if I could get my speakers back to go through and uh, show your video, that would be awesome. Okay, and so I should see Kathy and there we go, wonderful. Okay, so it looked like we answered. There were people that answered lots of questions as we went. But Kathy, would you go ahead and um, say what you said in the chat just briefly on nematodes? Someone asked a question about nematodes and uh, as a problem in the soil. So there are a lot of different kinds of nematodes. Some of them are pests um, for certain kinds of plants, and they were asking in reference to no-till. So. Um, with no-till, don't leave roots in the soil that are pest infested. So if you have nematodes in a root, it, you don't, don't, don't leave that root in the soil. The other thing is that crop rotation is very important. Pests, you don't want to send out a little signal to pest, a particular pest, that this is where it can always find its food. You want to vary the crop that you plant in a particular spot. So if you have nematodes in the soil, um, eating a root, you, you do want to pull that root out and discard it. Um, oh, and I have another question. So um, 
that the, the other question has to do with eggplant. And I'm not sure if all three of you grow eggplants, but I know Don't. I, yes, okay. So Kitty, let me give you this question then. The question is, um, the, this person has started out and they were, the eggplant plant was producing beautiful purple eggplants. And now it's just get, producing green eggplants. And she was wondering why. Interesting. It is interesting. Uh, I don't know. I haven't had that experience. Um, Kathy, what do you think? Well, eggplant is uh, one of the, the plants that really, really likes heat. So it could, oh. it could partly be um, that uh, we had a cool period over the last few weeks. A uh, number of cool days, at least out here in Sebastopol. And so I don't know where you are, but eggplants do better in certain kinds of areas. Um, they do take a lot of heat. Uh, I'm not sure why they're not ripening, but um, we the weather has yeah. we had a hot spell early on and then it was cooler. So that could be part of it. But that's a good guess because eggplants are a member of the tomato family. Tomato family. And and uh, your tomatoes will stay green and not ripen uh, often when it's not hot enough. So right. that's, that's a pretty good guess. But we can certainly look up uh, eggplants right. and see uh, on the site. And uh, we can post that in the uh, weekly information. Right. And the Master Gardener website has um, good articles on different kinds of crops. So I encourage you to look there. I see someone asked about the no-till appropriate for container gardening as well as, uh, or only garden beds. So that's a good question. I think any, the smaller your container, uh, the more challenging it is perhaps to use a no-till approach. However, um, saying that, you know, you start with a, a good, um, organic planting mix. And as Kitty said, in a container, you're trying to have something that is sustainable. So you look for something that doesn't have peat, but has other elements mixed in it. Um, and then you want to, um, to continue to add compost to that, to that soil. That's probably the most uh, realistic is to continue to add a good organic compost. The whole idea of no-till, the approach is to, to create a, a food uh, a system or a, a living system in the soil. So you're trying to keep your soil alive and most container potting mixes aren't really alive. They're a high nutrient mix. If you want to keep it alive, you can, uh, depending on the size of the container, you can plant a, a cover crop in the winter if you're not using that area. And we will be talking about cover crops later on since it's one of my favorite topics. Um, but you can plant a, what's called a green manure mix and you can uh, give, that, give that a try in the winter and you cut that down and use it to enrich the soil. So yes, you can do a no-till approach, but modified uh, if you're doing a container gardening. Kitty, also. Also, uh, no-till doesn't have to be large scale. If you think about, we have always said, pull it out. No, don't pull it out, cut it out. So hold the plant, cut it just below soil level and remove it and leave the root in the ground. And that is one of the major points of no-till. Also, right. the idea is not to disturb the soil, to disturb it as little as possible. So by leaving the roots, by adding the compost, by enriching the soil in your pot so that it mirrors a, a garden bed that has soil that is constantly changing. Okay, I've got a question for you, Kitty. Yes. Um, how about I sort of when I was filling in some time, I um, opened up the the question about curing, uh, uh, knowing when to pick your winter squash and like the pumpkins. 
And so um, if you want, do you, would you like to talk about that a little bit more? And I know like one year I had lots of butternut. I planted way too much, but I ate them all through the winter. Um, but I did let them cure outside. So um, would you like to answer that or would you like me to throw that off to somebody else? I would say that that's uh, pretty much a Kathy McFan question. Okay. Uh, I will say that anytime you're harvesting uh, winter squash, something that you want to last, uh, you have to make sure you do not nick the surface. Right. So once mm -hmm. you have opened up a hole in that surface, you have shortened the uh, length of time that you'll be able to store it. And it's more about correct storage than and making sure that it was fully ripe when you harvested. Kathy, what do you think? Oh, I think Sorry, you've spoken to it, but I think what Toby said is you do want to make sure that the stem is dry and hard. That's the first indication. Um, and basically, I leave my winter squash on as long as I can. I mean, I'm, Me there are certain squashes that I could begin eating now, some of the delicatas, but as much as possible, I try to leave them on the vine until the vine just looks so ugly and intolerable. And Right, you can't take it anymore. Yes. And if you scrap yeah, I mean, the skin, too. And yeah. the color changes, too. You'll, you'll see the color change from that light green and it becomes this, well, with the butternut, because I grow butternut, you see that skin become a really deep tan and, and it becomes hard, not soft. And that's another way to check that it's ripe. That's, and then I have one more question and, and then I think everything else has been pretty much answered. Um, uh, my one question is, Yellow leaves, and I've seen this a lot on the Sonoma County um, Gardeners Facebook page. Um, you know, lots of, especially new people, not all new people, they're seeing yellow leaves this time of year. And lots of people think that yellow leaves only mean that you're watering too much. So can you tell us what yellow leaves this time of year mean and what we should do about it? Who would like to take that? I'll start. Uh, uh, yellow leaves uh, is an interesting symptom of many different things. So you can have yellow leaves because you have a virus, you can have yellow leaves because you water too much, you can have yellow leaves because your, your plant is a heavy feeder and it's depleted the fertility of the soil around the plant. And I recommend that you get a book like this or, or use the Master Gardener website to look for multiple symptoms. And if it's just yellow leaves, you're sort of shooting in the dark. Test the soil. Is it very dry? Is it very wet? Put a screwdriver in the soil. If it's wet down a foot, that's probably too wet. Where do you live? How hot has it been? And then think about when was the last time I fed these plants? If they've been in the soil for six months, some of our plants have been in the soil for six months now, and uh, that's a lot of feeding. So you might want to think about giving them a boost, feeding them with a generic soluble fertilizer. Great. Also, if you're talking about flowers, some of them with this cold that we've been having have been shutting down and their leaves start turning yellow naturally because the sugars and the flu and the, the nutrients aren't getting to the leaves, just like it happens to the trees in the fall. Awesome. That's great. And, and if you have saved the the chat, you can go back in and look at some of those links. Um, we do have a member that's gone through and put together a page on our website that lists fall and winter food gardening articles and resources that we've talked about and maybe ones we didn't get to. So we really encourage you to, to go to, to that page and take a look. Um, and, and it is in your chat. 
this has all been recorded and we will go ahead and um, put this up on the website. Just give us a couple days to get that all edited and ready. Um, feel free to go through and, you know, put a last question or something that you're looking forward to for next month veggie happenings. But we're so happy that everybody joined us. Um, for their lunch break and are talking about um, plants, our favorite subject. So we'll see you next time.